So good morning and welcome again to Brocade. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before and for those of you on the stream, um, just very quickly, less than five minutes, I'll do a quick introduction of who we are. Um, we will then uh, segue to Mr. Dave Meyer, who is going to be talking about some cool stuff he's working on going forward. And then, um, unfortunately, for those of you following along at home, we will be cutting the live stream. Um, we will be capturing the video. The video will go live in a couple of weeks, so be sure to look for that on the Tech Field Day website. So for now, oh, please don't sue us. All right. <laughs> Okay, so Brocade was founded in 1995. Um, it has gone through some uh, both organic growth as well as some growth by acquisition, uh, acquired McData and a couple of other storage companies early on in its career. In 2009, acquired Foundry, and by that mechanism got into the IP space. Um, we have more recently, what, about 18 months ago, I think, uh, acquired Viata um, with the, uh, the V-Router. Um, and we continue to push uh, ever further into uh, software networking, um, which we'll be talking a lot more about today. Um, the first time we had you guys here, I said, we make stuff. So we make stuff. We continue to make all the stuff that we made before. We have added, of course, the software networking, the vRouter, and the virtual ADX, which is our virtual load balancer since that time. And we'll be bringing out some more stuff in a couple of weeks. And with that, I will hand it over to Mr. Dave Meyer. Thank you. Hey, what version of Ubuntu is this thing running on? <laughs> it's like I've never seen this before. All right. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think you guys have come to expect me to say something that's maybe not exactly conventional. Um, you know, I'll just tell you up front, I've never talked about a product, not when I worked at Cisco and not when I've worked here. Um, I, I, for some reason, I'm not good at that. But uh, this is a, about, you guys are going to be kind of like you're an experimental group here because I haven't talked to anybody about this. So, and, and I don't know exactly how to do it right yet. So um, this is something completely different. Again, um, I think I talked about Open Daylight last time, or maybe I didn't. I, t I think I talked to, about you, to you guys about complexity once. Anyway, so this is something, now this is something that I've been working on a little bit. Um, I've been calling it software-defined intelligence. Um, it's kind of an interdisciplinary approach to using all the software-defined X, all of the software-defined stuff, and making something different happen. And I'll explain to you what I think that is. And by the way, you guys can have these slides uh, if anybody would want them. So anybody remember this slide? This is a slide I used to try to tell um, my management at Cisco and my management here that, hey, you know, something's happening with software, you know? And, uh, you know, basically this was all about, you know, hey, things are becoming more software and less hardware, okay? And there, there was some nice biological metaphor there. But really, um, this is what it is, is that clearly SDN, and I'm, I'm gonna start to call this SDX because it's software defined everything, right? Or maybe it's SDE, I don't know. Um, Clearly, the promise of this wasn't just doing the same thing we've been doing, only in a sort of somewhat different way. It's rather than, you know, we can use programmability in the network, SDX maybe, um, to do things in a much more intelligent way. And um, I haven't come up with good acronyms for this yet, but compute, storage, networking, security, energy, and probably other things, right? So they're all software defined now. So what's the goal here? I want to introduce you to this software-defined intelligence thing, the idea I have here, or the idea many of us have here. And uh, it's kind of basic foundational technology, which is machine learning. And um, we'll look at a few applications, but I want to demystify the machine learning part of it for you. How many people know what machine learning is? Okay, that's good. Um, then this talk might give you some information. Um, so, so, um, what is software-defined intelligence? What's a brief overview of machine learning? I'm gonna just talk about one uh, machine learning algorithm, which is artificial neural networks. It's kind of interesting. Um, I'll show you how it works. It demystified it. You can write code to do it right now, and I'll show you some code that does it, and then some applications, and how we think we're gonna go there. So, is that way too small? Um, 
So it's a discipline. It, it, it's going to join networking with machine learning. So the idea here is to take a quantum leap in the intelligence of networking that we have now. And, and why can we do this? Because we have all these software-defined capabilities everywhere and APIs everywhere. But so it's sort of like on the action side of SDN, for example. Um, and, and I mentioned this, um, you know, compute, storage, networking, security, energy, all this stuff. And the foundation of all of this is machine learning and data science. So what's data science? Well, it's all the stuff you do around big data, analyzing your data, and things like that. By the way, this is one of the reasons why this has become popular, because there's just such a huge amount of data available. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a bit, but it's really a data-driven thing. And the first applications will be in something I've been calling network learning. The name of this is going to change. I just made up all these terms. So, um, but basically, I want the network to get a lot smarter, a whole lot smarter, using this technology. Um, and I want to give an example here quickly so you'll get the idea. So you know how when we do DDoS, what do we do? We get a big giant S-flow collector and we jam all this stuff from the S-flow collector onto a disk or some back-end analytics farm somewhere. And then we're just crushing along on it and all of a sudden we say, hey, there's a DOS going on. And here's some information about the DOS and then we put a flow entries in wherever they are and collect the DOS somewhere. Get it off our network, stop it, drop it, whatever we do. So that's a reactive thing. If we have this kind of uh, technology I've been talking about, we'll be able to predict it. And you can't predict it exactly, it's a statistical thing, but you'll be able to say something like with 0.5% or 0.05%, depending on how good your data is and how good your predictions are. You know, so the probability that you'll, you'll uh, experience of an event of some sort will be something you'll be able to understand. Wasn't this, like someone was doing something recently where they released some of their... Um code for trying to detect who was likely to be attacking them based on your various things on social media, whatever people bragging about stuff, you know, take some of that other more human predictive analysis, I guess, and try and figure out what might be coming up. As yeah, well, um, actually, that's data, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can crush that into an algorithm that, that you can use this way, you can definitely use that. Just like as another data source, yeah. another input, another... It's data, right? Yeah. Um, and more generally, there's a whole idea of predictive security based on this. this is just one application. And uh, there's this other thing I've been working on with some people in the internet space about using uh, the routing registries and the BGP tables to predict where spam, where spammers are going to turn up, what prefixes they're going to turn up behind. Hmm. There's some kind of interesting stuff in there. But it uses the same technology, right? So the larger goal is to un uncover new relationships and structure in network data. That's really what we're trying to do. Um, and, and, you know, if there are trivial correlations, you don't care, right? So most of the correlation engines that are out there find the straightforward correlations. What we're looking for here are deep, un unknown correlations. So there's a trivial example here. I'll talk about this one if we get to it. But this is something published by the Google guys. And what they did was they had a data center, uh, uh, several data centers. And what they did was they collected 19 parameters. I'll show you this at the end of this. And they calculated something called PUE, um, power, power utilization efficiency. This is a metric uh, that's used in the industry to try to tell um, how much of the power used in the data center goes to IT versus to actual uh, servicing customers. And they did a really kind of interesting thing. They computed this, but um, it's, it's essentially a trivial example because you would do this as an undergraduate but they got huge results out of it. So why use machine learning? Well, I think you guys know all this stuff. Uh, way too much data, traffic, uh, network traffic, um, complexity of networks themselves, like who really knows end to end how some of these things are interacting. Um, application behavior, nobody really has a handle on that. Too many sources of data for humans. And then, you know, too many black boxes in the network. You know, it's just like you, you, they don't have well-defined behavior, so you can only look at their I.O. behavior. And we also need to aggregate our solutions because we've got to get the most out of our data. So there's so many reasons. I just listed a few here. So here's my picture of this. Now, don't take this too literally, right, because none of these things are actually layers. They're just drawn this way because it's easier for me to draw this way. So the idea here is there's some physical stuff, and maybe that kind of goes up over here. And then there's virtual stuff that sits on top of that, maybe V switches or whatever they are. And then you have all of this SDX stuff, you know, SDN, software-defined uh, compute, virtual machines, storage, energy, 
and sensors. This actually is kind of a new one, right? So there's the Linux Foundation has a whole thing around open source um, SD Sense, as I'm calling it. And then this is something that um, Martin has been talking about, software-defined security, right? And that kind of goes up and down this whole stack. Well, this thing actually, oh yeah, an NFV kind of fits in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, <laughs> somewhere. So this thing kind of sits on the, this, this software-defined intelligence thing is going gonna, is gonna to sit on the side of this and see all of this. So its scope is really here. All of that. So that's the scope that I'm looking at for all of this, right? All right. So that's kind of what it is. But I want to give you a little bit more detail, but I need to give you an overview of what machine learning is first. So machine learning is kind of about computational ways of learning. You know, and, and, and it's, um, I'll tell you in a, in a second. But basically, what you're trying to do is you're trying to use computational you know, elements, algorithms, all of that kind of stuff to improve your performance by experience. And, um, you know, biological and technological systems have this. It's all data driven, right? So there are, there are hundreds, there are hundreds or thousands of machine learning algorithms, hundreds of new ones every year, but it's really about the data. And I'll say a little bit more about that. So this is one, um, Example, uh, one definition, and I'm just going to say this: this is this is not that useful, but people cite this. It's just never used. So the guy, the idea is, um, it's about um, algorithms that can increase their performance on some tasks by their experience. In other words, um, you know, something like zero uh, day detection, and that would be the task. The performance is how how much can you detect, and how many false positives do you get? Because false positives in this in this kind of environment are a big problem. And then the, then the um, experience is data, the set of attack-free uh, traffic flows. Um, but that's not all that useful. I just wanted to show that as a, as a possibility. But, you know, more directly, it's basically we have a lot of good reason to believe that, um, you know, very smart data analysis and utilization of that data, which is, by the way, coming out of all of this SDX stuff, is going to be essential for any kind of technological anything going forward. Basically, the key to optimizing those algorithms is feeding it more and more data, right? Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. But yeah, um, well, there's two different things going on, and it, and it has to do with the kind of data that there is. So it's, it's basically online and offline. So the online things um, have that property, right? They get better. Right. The offline ones, if you wanted it to get better, you'd have to recompute it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is something from Andrew Ning, I, which I think is really good. This is basically... Training a, 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 learning, a trained learning algorithm is very complicated. You know, what you get out of the thing is very complicated. You don't even know what it is, really. But the algorithm that creates it itself is usually pretty simple. And I'll show you a few of those. So the complexity of the whole thing comes from the data, not the algorithm, which is very different from how we write code and things like that today. So um, this is kind of a good thing because we all know how to come up with uh, uh, complex data, but you know, coming up with complex algorithms that work on this is hard. So this is actually a good thing. So what, what machine learning people say is that you know, he or she who has the best data wins because it's really about that. So machine learning is all about the data, but here's an interesting thing to keep in mind for this. Like who owns that? It's the customers who own it. So Brocade doesn't actually own it. So it makes you think that maybe the way to do this is to field a SaaS kind of service, right? ML, AAS, machine language as a service. You see, this reminds me a lot of um, the whole concept of anti-fragility, like the background of the black swan. Uh -huh. I know Netflix, and, and, I, and I know they do that with Chaos Monkey, because yeah. their goal is you know, to use this. But Chaos, Chaos Monkey, Monkey uses machine learning in the background. And it, well, it generates, every time it fails something, it generates more data to learn from and create a more you know, stable infrastructure as yeah. a result. Yeah, exactly. So, so here's another way to say the same thing in a cartoon form, right? So today what we do is, you know, we have some data, we have a pro, we read some code, we get some data, and we get some output, right? It's kind of how it works. In machine learning, what happens is this. Um, you take data and the output, and you compute the program that works on the next example. So this is a very different way of thinking about the world. So we've got to do some business. Um, so... This is a bold statement, I guess. Um, 
almost everything else in our network stacks is commoditizing right now, right? I mean, everything is. Um, probably not things like where there's um, high performance requirements like core of the network or something like that, but everything else. Um, intelligence doesn't. So for people who want to do this kind of work, they have a long runway of time they can use to do this. So just keep that in mind because this stuff, this, the intelligence that you can build will not commoditize. In fact, it just gets better by use instead of the other way around. What, do you, what can you do with it? Okay, I think <clears throat> there's a long list, but you know, these are all the standard things, right? Pattern recognition, optimization is something we're gonna do a lot in the network. Pattern recognition is something, and generation is something we're gonna do a lot. Anomaly detection is something like the DOS thing I was just talking about, although you could do a, a whole but, bunch of different things, especially if you can do it online. Um, prediction prediction would, is a very, a very compelling um, <clears throat> kind of application, and robotics is something we haven't gotten to yet in the network world, but we will. Um, so what's missing here? All of this compute, storage, and networking stuff that's just not really being analyzed in this way. Although there are, you know, there are analytics companies who are using technology like this. So when would we do it? When, there, when there's patterns that exist in our data, but we don't know when they, what they are. You know, if you know what they are, you can, do, you can use traditional methodologies. Um, and we can't pin down the relationship between uh, this stuff mathematically. If we could, we'd just write the code. We have lots of unlabeled data. So in data that you get from machine learning comes in two forms, basically. And this is kind of to your question. Labeled data says, I got this bunch of data. I got a, let me give an example. I got a bunch of pictures. In those pictures, I say, this is a cat. This is a dog. That's labeled, right? Unlabeled data is, I give you the pictures. Tell me what they are. The latter one, of course, is harder, right? And Oh, yeah. And then... This is important. It's really heavily focused on implementability. And the whole thing is, there's no magic here. I mean, this, this is, you know, people get all confused. Like, people ask me, oh, you mean you guys are going to build biological... No. All of this machine learning stuff is just a bunch of algorithms, you know, and data. So let's see. Why is it hard? Oh, why is it hard? What's it to? I mean, how do you even describe it, right? See, that's why you need machine learning, because you have a problem like this. You can't even describe it, so you can't write code that says, I mean, if you tried to get every corner case of every two, you'd never get it, right? So you have to, you have to develop a different way of doing it. So I mentioned this briefly. There's two kinds of main branches, supervised or learning. That's where you have this labeled data thing. It's like somebody's telling you. <coughs> and there's all kinds of this stuff. Um, data sets that you can use to uh, benchmark your algorithm with and all this kind of stuff. And then there's this unsupervised learning where the training data that you get is just a bunch of uh, whatever. You don't know what it is, right? So, for example, the Google guys, what they did was they, they fed their thing um, YouTube videos and it discovered what a cat was. And, and it also got a face detector. And then there's some kind of more minor kinds. This one's important called transfer learning because we want to be able to learn, reuse what we learned. And that, that's kind of a newer kind of thing. So that's kind of what machine learning's like. Um, I, I want to kind of make it a little bit more... How am I doing time-wise? Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. I want to make it a little bit more um, concrete. So artificial neural network is an algorithm that you're, you're going to see it. You know, I mean, if you look down in the algorithms that you use in, in your work and in your daily life, you're going to see a lot of artificial neural networks, um, you know, like things like Siri and um, Google cars that drive themselves, um, command completion or on your, <coughs> excuse me, when you're, ta when you're typing, uh, things like that. Um, so I'll give you a bit of history, a little bit of the biology, and then these are the two things I want to show you so you'll know what they are. There's all this other stuff, but I'm not going to talk about that because, you know, this Understanding this is a, you know, a course at Stanford or something. So I'm trying to give you the high points so you can get the idea of what I want to do. Um, so over time, neural networks became popular and then became less popular. These guys kind of almost killed the whole th thing, and I'll show you why in a second. Um, but this guy came up with this idea of a perceptron. I'll show you what that is. And then <coughs> Jeff Hinton and his colleagues at... Uh, 
they're at Toronto. Jeff Hinton's now at Google. Um, and, um, but they, uh, they rediscovered this thing called backpropagation, and I'll show you how that works. Um, and it kind of revitalized the entire field, and from there it just kept going. Uh, yeah, so brains, brains are kind of what people are building all this on. But if you look and try to compare, you know, um, it's got to be more than it's got to be more than what you see. And in particular, I was just look. I just met, looked at this. You know, this thing has you know what? How many orders of magnitude more than this? Seven orders of magnitude in terms of processing speed. But somehow your brain can process this stuff differently. And we haven't gotten to that yet. We just don't understand what it is. <coughs> but. I'll tell you that the guys at Google, what they're involved in is, and, and Facebook and Netflix, they're involved in what's essentially large-scale brain simulation to try to crack this because they want to be able to use the same kind of advantage in their, process, in their products. So if we get more time, we can talk about the um, architecture of the brain, but um, let's go on. So here's the idea. How many people um, know they had a biology class in high school? Okay, so you know what a neuron is, right? So a neuron has these parts, right? Dendrites were kind of like inputs, right? And then it has this cell body sometimes called a soma. That's where it kind of does some processing. And then it has this output thing called a synapse, right? And then the other dendrites fit over here, and that's how they talk. <coughs> and basically, the, the thing is a computational device. You know, that's, that's what it does. And I'll show you the computation it makes. So here was the first try. <coughs> this was the perceptron. So this kind of basic idea about an artificial neuron, um, this is what it is, right? So remember, this is just an algorithm. It's nothing more than that, right? And this is what it is. Um, so basically what it outputs is there's these weights and then there's inputs. It calculates the sum of the, the you know, the ith one of these and the ith weight. It just adds them up kind of has a bias so they can this thing so you can mess around with it and it and it's one if it's above zero and it's zero otherwise so it looks like this right step function that was really ugly because the the main reason is because if you want to do interest anything interesting with this it's not differentiable right here so this thing is really hard to use you know so this is this is one of the reasons why this kind of lost some um some um uh, uh, interest, basically. So, later on, people came around with this idea of an auto, a, you know, artificial neuron. It looks the same. The difference is it calculates this same thing, right? This times that, this times that, this times that, and sum it up. That's what this is. Have some bias terms so you can mess with it. And then apply some function to it. And that's, that's where it was different. And what is, okay, so what does that function look like? It's called activation function. So it looks like this. It could be linear. So that's just whatever, the, that's kind of like what the perceptron did. It can be something called a logistic function, which really just squashes the data into zero, one. So if you want the output to be a probability, use a logistic function, right? Because it's between zero and one. And then hyperbolic tangent, it does it between minus one and one if that's what you want. So these are kind of the things that people put in there algorithms to do this. So what's the neural network if that's that? Okay, how much time do I have? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay, well we can talk a while in that case. Um, so what's the neural network then? Um, you know, this is a thing that's really amazing. People just think it's some kind of magical thing, right? It's just an algorithm. And it's, you know, it, it, it's built to uh, solve engineering problems, but it does it in the opposite way than we're used to, right? So the algorithm, the neural, the, the uh, artificial neural network algorithm is very simple, but what it computes is a really complicated function, which frequently you don't know exactly how it works. <laughs> so, and how do you do it? You do it with a group of those kind of, those uh, artificial neurons, neurons that I was just making. So what can you do? You can do classification, you know, it's A or B or C. You can do regression, that's like, I want to compute a function. Um, you can do generalization, so get the patterns out of the data and then do something with that in post-processing. There's kind of two, oops, there's kind of two types. Feed forward neural networks, I'll talk about those because they're simpler. 
and recurrent neural networks, um, which actually have cycles in them. The feed forward ones don't have any cycles, so it makes the whole thing easier. So what is it? So let's see, how to, descri how to, how to describe this. So you get an input thing, and usually it's called a vector, right? So these are just you know, values for variables, usually, right here. And then these are called hidden layers. And generally, what you can see here is these are all completely connected to this, right? So this one's connected to all of these. This, this one's connected to all of these. Um, you, might, you might ask the question, does that scale? Nah, not really. Because totally if fine. you have really high dimensional data, like say you have an RGB image that's 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. So each one of those pixels is one of these, right? So that's a million, three million dimensional data. So you have three million dimensions to your data that easily, you have a hard time working with that. So you can't connect them all up, and there's ways to get around that. And then these are called these are where the artificial neural neurons are, and these are just called hidden layers. Why are they called hidden? Because whatever the representation of this is in here, because that's what happens. This is some representation abstraction, in in the real most real term of abstraction gets computed in here, but it's not seen. So same thing here, right? And then this is called the output layer, and you just out, you, there's various ways to do that. So these are all our artificial neurons, all of these things. And then you hook them up in some way, and you, um, and then you have them each compute uh, a function like the one I described. So it'll, this one will sum up all of these, and then it'll, it'll apply, say, logistic function or it'll apply it linear. And then somehow this thing learns. How does that work? Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you in a second. But uh, so what's interesting about this? Um, the main interesting thing is that these hidden layers are, in the, are, are abstractions of this data. So, you know, we talk about abstractions and networking all the time, but we don't have a good, a good way of describing what an abstraction is. What gets computed in here are real abstractions of this data. So it's kind of an interesting way to think about that. Um, abstraction was such a big term, um, especially when SDN came along. Oh, well, we want to compute on a graph rather than, you know, it's an abstraction. What did that really mean? This, this has a strong, um, this, this formalism has a strong idea of an abstraction. So again, what is machine learning now that we know that? Well, you know what? It's really interesting. What learning really consists of, remember, let's see. This one doesn't show it, but so each one of these has a weight. Remember that? And you sum up all the weights, and then you compute the function. Learning consists of learning those weights. So, and that's how your brain works, too, by the way. It's the weights on those arcs that are both your memory and your knowledge. So biological inspiration, if you like. So I mentioned this, the two main types are supervised and unsupervised. Um, and basically here, this is the most common because it's easier. This, this is where all the action really is. Unsupervised, what's called unsupervised deep learning. In other words, it's unsupervised because, the, because you just give it the data. And it's deep learning because the uh, neural network itself has many layers, hidden layers. So where does learning take place? I'm going to show you what that is because that's the demystifying thing. So in supervised learning, what you do is, um, you have a bunch of data that's what's called labeled. So what it, the example I used before was, okay, these are cats, these are dogs, this is PUE for this set of parameters. And you have a training set, so you have that. Now, why, why why do people want to do unsupervised if this is easier? Because getting labeled data is extremely expensive. You got to have humans do it. You know, so as a result, um, if you want to do image processing or something, there's these giant data sets that are available and you can benchmark against them, but they're extremely expensive. And by the way, most of the data in the universe is unlabeled, like on YouTube or like on the web. The stuff's unlabeled. So what it looks like is, think of it as a matrix, right? Um, you have this training data, and each, each row of this matrix, or each row of this thing, is a label, 
and a bunch of these X's, right? So you can call them features. Sometimes they're called inputs at the input layer, but they're features in the middle layer. And then the training set just provides the examples that the network gets taught with. So the way you'll usually see this, and this stuff is gonna come into our lexicon um, sooner rather than later, but the way you'll usually see it is the first one or the zeroth one is this is the row basically and this is the column right and so you got these things and then that's the label why is usually so it looks like this think of it as like the ith row of that thing looks like that you know and then you then what do you do with that okay that's cool what do you do with it oh well, let me tell you what unsupervised is uh just uh really in unsupervised what you do is you discover <coughs> the unknown structure in the data this in supervised case, they're telling you what it is. Here, you discover it. And by the way, as I said, deep unsupervised learning is where it's at. That's, that's where, um, if you see what's going on in Google, if you see what's going on in Facebook, if you see what's going on at Netflix, it's all this. Because you can't really do very much with labeled data because there's just not that much of it. Um, yeah, so uh, generally find relationships, right? And I think this is the true meaning of abstraction. Where we talked about abstraction in, in you know, SDN, it was, it was very, I don't know, Matt, what do you think? I mean, I think it was very, overused. yeah, it was loosely defined, right? <clears throat> and I remember seeing Scott and Nick and all of those guys going, oh, well, we want to, like, we want to we wanna build a routing algorithm. We want to build it on a graph. The graph was the abstraction, but that's very loose. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not very formal in any way. Mm -hmm. So you can't really take that and do anything with it other than to say, hey, that'd be easier. Maybe. So in the unsupervised case, no need for labeled data. The network itself finds it. And then these are some of the kinds of ways. I mean, there's so many of these. There's so much work going on here. I just listed four or five of the top ones. These are, these are probably the top two. I'm not going to talk about this stuff because this, again, this, each one of those is probably a week. Um, but I, I just want to give you some examples of all the stuff that's going on out there. Again, none of it's really being applied to networking. So Actually, let me ask you about that for, for just a second, because the Open Daylight Project has the Affinity sub Project submission from Plexi. That is some of what they do there reminds me of some of what you're talking about. Yeah, they they do it, but they but they do it in a sort of informal way. So yeah, let me let me just expand on that for just a second. So you know, there's all these companies that do analytics now, right? And they all, by the way, if you find your favorite analytics company, go look at their website. I guarantee you, they say something about how they're doing machine learning on it somewhere why it's just the hottest thing around right now for some reason it, you know it just all of a sudden um and i think it has to do with the fact that um um basically there's been great success inside google and facebook and netflix and other places and it's computationally feasible now when it wasn't before um but what's going on at plexi is sort of not this formal in terms of what how they discover the relationships between the affinity relationships. It's, it's, mo it's much more ad hoc. Right? Mm -hmm. So they're not doing this kind of trying to, trying to... So what does machine learning do? What it does is it takes data and tries to build a, mo a statistical model that will predict the behavior of the network on the next example. They're not doing that. Right? So like ingesting data and, dr and using that to drive more automated relationship building. Yeah proactively like you see like oh i see that this you know this is these are the telltale signs of a switch failing uh in about like five days or something like that predictive yeah. not Let reactive me, exactly right yeah. so that's, so that's the relationships that's that's a great first step but i think what we're talking about here is using that data to drive those proactive decisions ahead of time yeah yeah so well what what i've been doing is there's there's these massive pcap data capture things databases on the on the network and I've just been jamming those through some uh, machine learning code that I've learned just to see what they would discover. And they just discover all kinds of stuff that I never even thought of. Yeah. Mm. You know? So if we have an operational network where we ha what we have is telemetry, basically you know, all the kinds of telemetry, you know, counters, you know, all the, all the different things we get. If we could just jam that through some big machine learning infrastructure, I, I'm sure we would learn interesting things, mm -hmm. you know? Mm. And, and that's kind of what some of these places are doing because, um, you know, you don't know exactly, one of the things about this is you don't, if the relationships between, say, say, consider a counter in a switch, the topology and a counter in another switch as variables. You don't really know the relationship between them. And if you do, it's trivial, right? Because you can see it, right? So 
if there is a relationship between them, that's what mach machine learning will find. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you'll find that, oh, when the counters go crazy over here, something happens over there, mm -hmm. and you didn't see that. Well, right. the one thing that we typically don't focus on enough is, is context of that data, right? Right. Where we look at, like, what, like, okay, cool, this counter increments in a certain pattern, we'll see the graph, but what about, what if we take other factors, like simple stuff, like time of day, but also, like, you know, when you're doing sales, like, uh, I see all the graphs with all the retail stores doing all the, P, uh, the POS spikes during the Super Bowl, and yeah. they get all kind of analytics out of that. So context yeah, and you is might, you know, you know what, you can cross it, you know, once you have this infrastructure, you can also cross it, I don't know who was talking about Google or Twitter, or what, so you have all your network data, just cross it with the Twitter yeah. feed. You know, and yeah. see what happens. You know, all data, and, and that, and that kind of thing is not something we have the capability to do. Right? Well, we do. Well, we now have the CPU processing power too to handle more data. We have, and we have more data. Is yeah. That okay? So yeah, that's a good. That's an excellent point. Um, we have. We can get. We can get more processing in the cloud if we want. If we don't want to. But also, a lot of this stuff's being done on GPUs because the um, because the amount of compute that you need to crush this stuff is significant. Like I'll tell you the the biggest. Uh, unsupervised deep learning project there has been out there that's at least documented was done by Andrew Ning who's a professor at um, Stanford and at Google now he's at Baidu um, they did this thing where um, well basically they had a they had a thousand um, servers 16,000 cores and they crushed all of this I forget how much YouTube data it was but it took them three days to train it on that size of a thing so you know it can be computationally expensive if, if it gets big. Okay, so so help me help me understand, and I may be asking a stupid question, but I, I do want to understand this because it, it's really intriguing to me. Uh, you know, algorithms are single function uh, tools, right? They do one thing, mm -hmm. but when you start talking about you know the, the the learning algorithms, now you're talking about spider webbing almost, right? Like when someone's talking and they they're they're jumping topic to topic, we call it spider webbing. But that's you're kind of describing that inside of an algorithm, right? Is is that is that what we're really talking about? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're what you mean, but let me try, okay? okay. And, and then and then tell me if I get it right. Um, so in machine learning, the algorithms themselves, and I'm going to show you how the neural network works. So you'll, I, I want to demystify this for you so you'll know how it works. It's okay. not that hard. Um, but the algorithm itself is kind of five minutes, down to five minutes. Okay, the algorithm itself is simple. It's the data that you feed through it, and then the, and then the function it learns that's complicated. And in fact, you don't know what it is, right, generally. Right. All right, let me see if I can show you okay. this quickly. Okay, we'll, we'll skip the brains. So we, we talked about this artificial neuron thing, right? So basically what it does is it has weights. So these are the inputs. It has weights. What you do is you take the input times the weight, the input, and then you add all those up. That's what this is doing. And maybe you give it a bias so you can mess with it a little bit. And then you call that an activation. Then you apply some one of those functions like logistic or linear, and you get what's called um, the output, the activation of it, right? And so... Um, that's what this thing is. Now, how do you put those together? Oh, forget that. It's mapping the bio. Okay, so we talked about that. So here's how you put it together. So remember, this looks complicated because they're all connected, right? Fully connected. So this is a one hidden layer neural network. What do you do with? How do you do? How do you make any sense out of this, right? Well, first off, you do the same thing we talked about. You just calculate that for each one of these. And then you, do, you apply that function for each one of these. And then at the, that layer, you just do the same thing. And you, and, and you get the output of the neural network, right? So that's the output of the neural network, untrained, right? Because like in the beginning, where do these weights come from? And that's kind of my point is so now you're you're actually adjusting your output based on what you're learning, what you're learning. Yeah, as so, you so far forward. we haven't done the learning piece. Right. So this is the feed forward part. That's why they called it feed forward, right? Because you're going from here to the top, right? So it's feeding forward, right? Okay. And where do the weights come from to do that in the beginning? Randomly initialized. Now, there's something else that can be, that's being done right now, and that's called an autoencoder, and we can talk about that another time. But there's another way to more sensibly um, initialize these. But in this thing, the way it's done is random. And then you go and learn and you adjust the weights. So how do you learn? So is each element in that hidden layer or the features different? Because otherwise it seems like you're just doing the same thing three times. Yeah, they'll all be different. Okay. Yeah. So they're all getting the same inputs, but... 
you're giving them different weights or yeah because the way it learns is they get combined at a higher layer so there's a back let me show you all right so that was this oh there's a there's a thing <coughs> not surprisingly you know if you remember from ands and knots you can make anything well for a single uh uh for a single hidden layer neural network you can compute anything in the same way the problem is it can be exponentially large so you know just like you learned in discrete math and then the answer ends up being 42 so yeah yeah it's 42 <laughs> so here's the key here's the thing there's this thing called an empirical risk minimization, and this is used all over the place. Anytime you go to some place where they're gonna do an optimization problem, they use this. And basically what it is is you define some kind of loss function, you look what you predicted, you look what the reality is. This is, uh, this is with um, labeled data, so Y is usually a label. So you compute something, you look at Y, you, you say, hey, I lost, this is my, and you compute a loss of that, and then you update the you update the weights with that, and let me show you how that works, because um, I'm out of time. So here's a here's a here's a simple one, right? So I compute this, and then I look at what I what what the what you told me it was. So I computed cat its dog. I get some kind of loss from that, right? Um, usually, I mean, you know, it's going to be put into a real number, right? So you're going to encode cat as one and dog as two, and and you're going to get some loss function here. So what you want to do is minimize that loss, and that's how you train it, by minimizing that. It gets a little bit more complicated, really. This is the one from the Google autoencoder. All this thing is doing is, it's saying, okay, um, this is the, re it re tries to reconstruct the input. So it reconstructs the input, sees what it really was, you know, and then um, this is trying to do something called pooling, and it just minimizes that. And that's how it learns the weights. It's a minimization problem, right? So here, let me show you on the, um, how, what the algorithm is. So what you do is, you, oh, you call the weights, going through this kind of fast. You call, you call the weights theta. That's a whole set of all the weights for the neural network, okay? Just call it theta. That's what the convention is. So you implement that forward propagation thing. Oh, so randomly initialize the Ws, right, the weights. Implement that forward pro propagation thing I showed you. Just calculate the sum of the, you know, things. It's pretty simple. Implement this back propagation thing, which I'll show you, and then just do that until it converges. Maybe. It may or may not converge. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> you know, there's a reason why. Oh, and, and again, this back propagation thing was the big breakthrough that Hinton and those guys got. So, how does this forward propagation thing work? We saw that already, right? You can compute that, compute that, you know, and it's just add those things up and apply the function, right? That's forward propagation. There's nothing to it. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, so here's the math. I believe you. <laughs> I don't understand, but I believe you. <laughs> it's simple. It's, it's uh, Trust me. I mean, you're not going to learn this all in, in, in oh, 20 sure. minutes, right? What, you're gonna, what I hope you do is take away, well, this stuff does work somehow. And, you know, if you want to go look deeper into it, you can ask me or you can just go and look online. There's plenty of information. I do, I do like the illustration, though, of using output as an input to another system because that's an under, uh, mm -hmm. mis, uh, underutilized uh, method of doing things, I think, in infrastructure today. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So here again, you see the same thing, right? You start here. You sum all those things up. That's what this is really saying. You apply that, whatever that function is to it, and you get the output, which are the, these things, right? And then you just do it again. And then you get the output, right? That's feeding forward, right? Sorry, I have to take a picture of this because this is priceless. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> this. <laughs> oh, okay. So how do you do the backwards? So now this is where you're going to train it. This is where it's going to learn. Back, back propagation. So basically what happens is you do the forward propagation, you get these things, right? But you have the labels. So <laughs> you have to, oh, dog, cat. And you just subtract that and then propagate the error back down through the network. And then go again. That's, that's how it does it. So how does that work? Uh, I don't know if I have it. <coughs> eh, that's the math. You know. So but this is probably an easy way to say it. Remember the thetas were all of the parameters? What you do is, for each pass through it, you take what you have and you subtract the error. And you try to follow the, the error down so you minimize it. And I'm not going to talk about that. All right. Let me just say one more thing, and then I'll give up on this. 
So when you do this minimization thing, keep this in mind. It's not, it doesn't always work. Because there's this idea in, in uh, op optimization theory that um, if you have a convex cost function, you know that J thing? If that thing happens to be convex like this, you're golden. Because any minimum in this is a global minimum. So you won't get stuck somewhere. Right? I mean, you won't, because remember, you initialize these things randomly. So you could start anywhere, right? You don't know. This is one where it's not, it's not convex, right? So you initialize the things random. You start here, you follow the thing down, and you wind up here when the minimum thing's over here. So you're completely wrong. So it can not work. So truth in advertising. You want to write some code to do it? Okay, here. Look, this did a three three layer hidden, this did the whole thing, right? I mean, and what I'm trying to show you here is there's plenty of code in the open source community, um, various ones. This is called PYBrain. Um, it's doing a three layer, three layer neural network, you know? Um, I, you know, I don't know if that, by the way, I don't know if this code scales or not. I, I just made a giant data set because one of the things that are in this thing is um, you can generate your own data. Mm. The point is, and you can look on that URL, there's kind of, Different, a few different ones in there that I did, but that's kind of a that's kind of trying to say there's all that machinery that I was just describing, but it's actually real and you don't need to know it. You can just go find it. So I'm gonna I'm out of time, right? Yeah. All right. So these Google guys did this. Let me show you this one thing. Here was what their data set looked like, right? They what they did was. They had 19, so the x1, x1 to x19, these were the x's, right? So the input vector were instances of these things, right? And the output was the PUE, the um, power utility um, effectiveness, sir. And let's see, they did the same thing, just textbook. Uh, this is the interesting thing. So they trained it on about two years worth of data, and wow. so... Um, the, the predicted is the blue and the actual is the red. It's pretty good, right? I mean, it fits really, really well. Um, I think over here, I don't think they had enough, um, maybe I have that there. Yeah, they didn't have enough training data, so the error got bigger over there. But the, the main thing is, is that they use this to optimize their power utilization, their data centers. And what they could do is, now they have this thing, which is actually a model of the interactions between all these variables and its relationship to this thing they wanted to compute. So what they could do is hold any one of those constant and change the other ones and learn about what the effect was. Now, that's one step less than what we want to do. We don't want to have to have people look at that. By the way, if you have analytics from some company and they show you graphs and stuff like that, that's all nice. But once you have to look at that, you've already lost. You know, you don't want to be, you want to be, I mean, look at that later, but you want to be a reactive and, um, or proactive anyway. So I'll stop with that. But what are a few of the things that I've been looking at doing? Uh, analytics is kind of obvious, right? I mean, what people call analytics today is kind of um, a degenerate or a trivial case of all of this, right? Um, <laughs> traffic classification, you know, flow identification, security, quality of experience. There's some really interesting quality of experience um, work that was has been done where the label was a subjective um, an, a subjective um, kind of um, characterization of what the quality of the experience was. Um, NFB style resource utilization, of course, right? Anomaly detection is kind of interesting. I didn't talk much about this, but like in nuclear power plants, they use machine learning to, to learn what the steady state is so they can do anomaly detection because they don't want to have to say, oh, well, here's an example of where the uh, nuclear power plant blew up. That's probably not good. Right, <laughs> you know. So you know, you want to, you have to do it different. All kinds of risk management um, and capacity planning problems you can do this way. Orchestration is completely untouched. It's completely untouched. Um, anything to having to do with uh, Internet of Things and sensor networking is pretty much untouched. Um, and there's just, you know, you can keep going. You got to pick a few and work on them. And then finally, oh, I said smarter IDS. Let me just show you this quickly, and then I'll be done. So. We know it's signature-based IDS. That's like building labeled data. We know what anomaly-based IDS is. You know, One detects what we know. One detects what's different from what we know. But what we want is unsupervised IDS detection, where 
basically the thing learns itself. And um, there's a couple of systems that actually do this. Right? And so what's nice about it is you don't have to know anything, um, no previous knowledge, no signatures, because up here that's what's really expensive. Again, getting labeled data is really expensive. Um, you don't need to build a traffic profiling or models. You don't need to uh, do a lot of the other things and you can detect unknown attacks and basically it's a major step towards autonomic networking. Autonomic networking needs this, right? If that's ever gonna happen. So that's where I'm going. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if, uh, I'll tell you, um, like, like the complexity stuff before, um, if anybody's interested in any of this and wants either to talk to me about it, wants to know more about it, wants to learn about it, just drop me an email. I'm glad to, I'm glad to you know, do whatever I can.